yes, theme, it's sapped, it's, uh, the, we're trying to teach the children and the adults as we meet together, how when we just get plugged into God's power, we can see, we can know what we need to see and do. And there's a memory verse the kids are learning, uh, and it comes out of 1 Peter, and they're going to put it on the screen right here. And they didn't. No, we're not. God has given us all the power we need to lead a godly life. That's what the memory verse says. And that's what the kids are learning every week. And, and uh, we have been teaching the same lessons the kids have been learning uh, for the past several weeks. So the, the lessons that they would learn about Peter, we would learn in this room. And we're hoping to have that conversation at home where we talk about the same Bible story, the same Bible lessons. And then we continue to grow faith. And i got to tell you, it is amazing how God kind of set that up. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, and for those of you who are visiting or, or you're new here, uh, last week, and we're going to talk about this openly, we're, we're, we're going to be a transparent church. Last week, our elders asked for the resignation of, of, of one of my good friends and uh, the minister, one of the ministers here, uh, Brian Bennett. And uh, that happened last week. But i got to show you where God's been working in our, in our messages. We started planning our Vacation Bible School uh, series uh, six to eight months ago for, for what would happen during Vacation Bible School. We had five lessons we had to choose from. And one of those lessons we had to drop because we're only doing four weeks, uh, four Sunday mornings of BBS. And so we just so happened to drop a lesson that placed the scripture we feel led by God, placed the scripture where it went. For example, um, the elders uh, found out about... Uh, the resignation uh, a couple weeks ago, and they told me before I had to preach uh, on June 10th. And the lesson was that day about Peter and how he was living is very spiritually, heard from the words of God, and then fell. And Jesus said, get behind me, you have the mind of Satan. And so our, our lesson uh, two weeks ago was, there, there was a little part in there that I loved, and it was trust God and love people and don't get the two confused. Trust God and love people, but don't get the two confused. And that just went with where our elders were and where we need to learn to be. It's, all, it's within all of us to fail and fall into sin. So we trust God and we love people, but we don't confuse the two. And then our PBS lesson uh, last week, uh, the day of the announcement, was on restoration. How can one person like Peter deny Christ three times and say, I do not know him? And then Jesus, under his grace and mercy, comes in and restores Peter fully as a son of God. And we really feel like God had laid those messages out for us ahead of time. So that we would learn what his word says and speaks into any situation, even a situation where we're hurting or we're sad or where we don't know what to do. His word speaks into that. And so uh, today I, I, I battled. I, I, I battled and I talked with some of our elders about this. I said, should I continue with the VBS lessons because it feels like God laid those out or should we talk about what went on uh, among the eldership, among the staff, among our church, and, and look at what God's Word says into our situation. Do we break from, from the lesson? So I, I want to tell you that the kids are learning about Peter and how he takes the message, the good news, to the Gentiles, Peter and Cornelius, out of Acts chapter 10. But we are going to discuss what's going on with our church and what the adults are talking about. And so we, we have some scripture. We're going we're gonna to jump around in a couple of different places in the Bible today. If you have your Bibles with you, um, you, can try to, you can try to hang with me. Um, or you can turn all the way back to Hebrews uh, chapter 12. That's kind of the main uh, passage for the whole Sunday. One of the elders I talked to about, should we, should we talk about what's going on in the church? He said, Dale, sometimes we're accused of not giving enough information. If we talk about it, then, then we can kind of get some information out. So we, we do want to communicate. Sometimes we do a good job, and sometimes we don't. Um, I had somebody I had somebody text me uh, last week. They said, are you going to let the visitors go before we make that announcement? And uh, do you want to, the text was actually, do you want to let the visitors go before we make the announcement? So nobody, you know, nobody knows. I said, well, yeah, we want to let the, let the visitors go, but that's not who we want to be as a church. We want to be transparent. We want to be open. So if you're visiting, you get all of us. Warts and all, as a people of God, 
See, we, we've all fallen. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all messed up incredibly. And, and sin is not eating a fruit off a tree. Sin is saying, I'm going to do things my own way instead of God's way. It is rejecting God. That's what sin is. Rejecting God, doing things your own way. And we've all done that. And yet, because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, because He became sin in our place, because He took all of our sins and nailed them to the cross, became sin in our place, a curse for us, took the punishment we deserve, God calls us saints. In the scripture, when Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, who were a lot more messed up than we are, he says, to the saints at Ephesus. Because of what Christ accomplished on the church, we're uh, on the cross. The church, the people who make up the body of believers are called saints. And we're so messed up, aren't we? And yet God calls us saints. And that, that's a beautiful thing. So if you're busy with us, we're we're broken. And right now our church is hurting. The staff found out a week before the church did. And uh, we went through shock. And then the shock began to turn into questions by the end of the week. And we figured as a staff and a couple of elders I talked to that maybe the church was kind of talk, doing, doing the same thing. We went through uh, shock. Hearing uh, Brian was asked for his resignation. And then uh, though that shock kind of turns into some questions. So, so we're going to look at some questions this morning. What happened? Uh, what's happening right now, and what are we going to do next? That's kind of the lesson we're going to talk about today. My sermon is titled, um, uh, Training, Not Punishment, but it could, could also be subtitled, What Just Happened? Last week when Craig made the announcement, uh, our rows were kind of set up in a, a semicircle on the way back, and it was like an explosion went off from this platform, and heads would snap back almost at the, at the there was a, enough delay where each row had it. All the way back to the road, like a ripple effect. It was like a little mini wave. And uh, so we, we need to talk about what, what happened and then what is happening now and then what's going to happen next. In fact, um, when we talk about what's happening now and what we're going to do next, I've asked Charlie Weaver, one of our elders, to come and join me on stage. And he's waiting and with a microphone ready to come. Not yet, Charlie. <laughs> So what happened? Uh, I read an interesting book by uh, Pastor Don Baker. It's called Beyond Forgiveness. I, I called Ronnie at the Christian bookstore here in town. They, he always can get books for us, um, and, and sometimes very quickly. I said, Ronnie, can we get that book for our church? It's, it's about a church that went through a similar situation. Uh, their minister fell into sin, asked to resign, and then it, it walked through, this pastor walked through what they went through as a church and how they healed and how they restored this minister uh, back into uh, good grace um, and community with his integrity, with his character. And uh, that book is out of print. So Ronnie suggested um, we look for other means of getting it. Amazon.com has some used books. It's called Beyond Forgiveness. It's, a, it's written by a pastor named Don Baker. It was written and copyrighted in 1985, but it was an excellent read. And one of the things that Don Baker mentions in his book is the church has this reputation of, of leaving their wounded behind. Or worse, kind of kicking them when they're down. That's kind of the reputation outsiders have in the church. Um, and sometimes people inside the church have that and think those thoughts too. If you're going to mess up, if you're going to fall into sin, or you're going to go against what God's principles lay out, then the church is going to cast you out. They're going to kick you while you're down. And that, I, I'm afraid that that does happen sometimes. But I found in this particular congregation, the opposite is true. In, in this body of believers... Now, for whatever reason, we we tend to lean toward how God tells us to do love, grace, mercy, forgiveness without compromise. And, and I think and I, I'm so grateful that I'm part of a congregation that kind of lives that kind of, lives that life out, lives out Christ among each other. And so, uh, whereas Don Baker sees this in church, um, and he says sometimes that means they're hypocrites, what it actually means is we're sinful people, and we've been forgiven, and we get to show that same forgiveness to others. But there are ways God lays out in Scripture on how to do that, on how to show forgiveness, how to show love, how to show grace and mercy. And so, um, I, I want to look at some Scripture, especially some of the Scripture that elders use in making their decision. For example... In reading and praying through the scripture, the elders found that there's a very clear and distinct call in the Bible to rebuke a brother or sister in Christ 
who is not living in a lifestyle that meets God's standards. A rebuke means to say, stop doing that. Don't do that. You're going to mess up your reputation with outsiders, with people inside the church, and you're hurting your relationship with God. The Bible has a very clear, distinct call that all Christians are supposed to rebuke their brother and sister when they catch them doing something they're not supposed to. What chapter and book would that be? I'm going to show you. Great question. I had a question. What chapter and book is that in? So, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. And we're going to put it on the screen if you didn't bring uh, your Bible today. What do you mean, though? I happen to have it. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Listen, listen to these words. Brothers, if someone is caught in, in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. Okay, well that makes sense. That makes sense. And then uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. Listen to these words, because this is along the same theme. So we got Galatians 6, 1, who says, If you find a brother or sister um, in sin... If you see it in the Word of God, this is what says sin is, okay? You don't get to choose what is sin and what is not sin. God chooses that. So if you see somebody smoking and you think smoking is bad for you and you think God should say that is a sin, God never said that was a sin in the Bible. Now you can go to your brother and sister and you can say, I think you shouldn't smoke, but this is probably it's bad for you. And they'll say, oh, I'm so glad you told me I didn't know. <laughs> But you can't necessarily call it sin. Now, you can make an argument from Scripture that smoking, God might consider it sin because he says, we are the temple the Holy Spirit lives in. Whatever you do to the temple, you're doing to the Holy Spirit. You don't unite the Holy Spirit, your body, the, the, the Holy Spirit living in the temple, with sin. So you can make an argument, hey, smoking, it maybe. But you also need to stop your brothers and sisters from going to get Big Macs. Okay? So this is what is called, God calls, he, he says what sin is, and he says what living righteously is. And we have to do that. We can't call sin, so we can't call something a sin that's not in here spelled out specifically as a sin. But we can read the scripture to each other. And so it says in Galatians 6, 1, brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual, you who are reading the book, who sees what's in here, tell them, rebuke them, and then restore them gently. 2 Thessalonians says this. And this is, this is pretty, pretty important and pretty harsh. 2 Thessalonians, a little further over and uh, toward the back. If anyone does not obey, do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. See, the point in Scripture of discipline, of telling someone to stop, is not to make them an enemy or to kill them. People who are in sin are hurting. The point of Scripture is not to hurt them more. The point of Scripture is to restore them. That's why it says don't treat them as an enemy. Treat them as a brother. The point is all Scripture and all of, all of Christ, this is, this is God's uh, gift to us in Christ, is restoration. Christ came and took our punishment on the cross so that we could be restored to God. He tells us to do the same thing. Brothers, if anyone has got sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. If anyone does not obey, do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed, but treat him warning as a brother. The shame is supposed to bring out godly sorrow that brings them back to Christ. In Matthew 18, we find this principle laid out in even more detail. And I love this passage. I'm going to read this passage um, out loud. It's Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. <coughs> Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. And I know that the elders were using these passages of Scripture as they were trying to decide, what do we do now? What do we do now? Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. Matthew 18. Oh, Matthew 18. It's on this page. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. 
But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that, that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or tax collector. That, that means kick him out. And there's, there's a couple of things that we, we need to look at in this passage. If you find your brother in sin, it says rebuke gently, treat him as a brother. This passage explains, go to them one-on-one, -on -one, where nobody else can hear, just between you two. And the point is restoration. If he listens, you have won your brother. If he listens, you have won your brother. And so I know one of the questions the elders were, were going through is, do we need to tell anybody? Can we just say, Brian has resigned for personal reasons and just go? Because I mean, there is scripture that says one-on-one. -on -one. And we're going we're gonna to talk about why they ended up where they did. But notice some other things about this passage. Notice that it's friend to friend, and then a couple of witnesses, and then it's before the church. God's pretty sharp in his review when you live outside of his principles that lead to life. It doesn't involve the elders, it doesn't involve the pastor, and it doesn't involve a whole group of your friends that came up. It's one-on-one, -on -one, it's with some witnesses, and then it is before the church. That's a big deal. And the point there is always restoration, not retribution, not attacking. I had a, a friend of mine who uh, I felt like had done me wrong. And I knew from this passage that I could get him. Yeah. Go to your brother and get him. And, and as I was praying about it, I read, it's not go to your brother and get him. It's go to your brother and restore him. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> and yet, when I went to my brother with that attitude, our relationship is hurt. We need to fix it. You did something that was wrong. Things changed. And I won my brother. God's word works. It's awesome. And we, we find this happening in the very first churches that were formed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm not going to read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a brother in the church that was sinning so terribly. Paul says that even the pagans don't sin like that. Even the people who don't know God don't sin like you've got a brother in the church sinning. Paul says, you guys are acting proud of it. Kick that guy out of church. A little bit of sin is going to work through the whole body and mess up everybody. But we find out in 2 Corinthians, if we just were with that passage alone, we might think, oh, it's retribution. You kick him out, you get him. Get your brother. But that's not what it is. If we find out in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, Paul says, he's had enough. Bring him back into the fold. He's repented. He said he's sorrowed. The point was restoration the whole time. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we find the answer in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. God's entire point of sending Jesus Christ for us is based on the same restoration principle. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So we, you see why we teach that every week. That gospel plays out in every situation. So that's where the elders were. This is kind of how they came to their, their decision on what to write, how to write it, how to present it into the congregation. In fact, Tony Brockmeyer and I, we came up with this really cool idea on how to present it to the congregation. And it was uh, so good and so wise. And so I prayed that morning, because the elders were going to come talk to the staff. I prayed this morning, if the, whatever the elders say, God just help me to trust them. Um, I'm going to go along with what they say. I'm going to say, okay, this is the way it's going to be. And I prayed, God, just you're in control. Uh, that's how it's going to be. The elders came in, and they didn't go with Tony and my plan. Okay? And so on the outside, I said, okay, that sounds good. And on the inside, I was like, oh, man, they're, they're stupid. How could they possibly make this decision? 
And then Charlie, he took me to lunch. He said, well, here's where we were. Here's, here's kind of how we came to this decision. Here's, here's some of the, the evidence and the facts that we know. Here's where we met for 12 hours trying to decide how to do this. And as he was talking, it occurred to me, oh, these guys are really wise and smart. They did the right thing. On the outside, it was okay with that, but on the inside, it really, I was really questioning it until he explained. Here's how, here's how they came to mouth. Well, here's some of the scripture they kind of use, because in Matthew 18, it says, go to your brother individually, seek restoration. But leaders are different. Leaders are called to a higher standard, and so the consequence for leaders are different than other people who follow Christ. So as, whereas Matthew clearly states we should go to a brother alone first, God does give a very clear guideline on how to do church discipline on leaders. So here's one that the elders considered, and this is one thing they, they took in their, in their mind. And this is out of 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that others may take the warning. Another translation, that was the New International Version, the, the English Standard Version, ESV says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, that's probably a closer translation, those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. And so Brian was not an elder, but he was playing the role of, of an elder in some instances. In the New Testament, elders are supposed to teach, they're supposed to preach, they're supposed to shepherd the flock. And Brian was doing all of those roles. And so the elders had to consider, we do not entertain the accusation unless there's two or three witnesses. And then they had to consider those who persist in sin need to be rebuked publicly. So I had someone ask me last week, why do the elders have to say what they did? Why did they just say for personal reasons? Because that doesn't protect the flock and it doesn't help Brian. But when we follow what God lays out for us, He provides protection and healing. And so that brings us finally to what God is doing around us now involved with us now. Charlie, would you come up here? I'll, I'll, as you make your way up here, I'll read our, our passage out of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. See, God, when he was in the Old Testament, Tony mentioned today lamentations. They were lamenting. They were sad. God was punishing them because they weren't living in righteousness. God poured out all of his punishment on their Christ. And so now, when we experience the consequences of sin, it might feel like punishment, but it's actually a loving father disciplining his children. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, we read these, these words. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Stop. What you're doing is wrong. It's going to hurt people and it's going to destroy our relationship. That's what rebuke is. Do not lose heart when the Lord rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. It's discipline. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. If you sin and you persist in sin and God doesn't give you a gentle nudging of rebuke, stop doing that. And if God allows you to continue to sin and he doesn't nudge you again, stop doing that. If he's not telling you to stop. As my father-in-law says, if you persist long enough, he'll pick you up and he'll slam you down so you'll listen. And don't we do that to our children? Well, not though. <laughs> but don't we spank our children? Don't we ground them? Don't we 
And the severity always goes with the crime. But if God's not doing that, then he says you're not even a child of God. That's a scary place to be. Because there are other passages of Scripture that says God gave them over to the lusts of their heart. Those are not children of His. The children of His, He disciplines. He nags at their conscience. He gives them a gentle nudge. Sometimes He drops the hammer, all for the point of restoration. Moreover, we have had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. Here's the key. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Harvest of righteousness and peace if you're trained by the discipline God gives. We all want that. So I asked Charlie, uh, Charlie, one of the things, one of the questions is, um, what, how did you all make your decision as elder? This is Charlie Weaver. He's one of our elders. Um, and then the next question a lot of people have is, what are the elders going to do? What's the church going to do now that we have a gap in our uh, leadership and staff? And so uh, would you mind explaining kind of where the elders uh, decided? I might even come over here and picture your microphone a little bit. Please, please. We didn't rehearse. We're not trying to get fresh. That's okay. Jim Williams accused me of something else. I'm a lot. I don't do that. Uh, what so, are the elders doing to fill the gap of, of Brian, uh, his vacancy? Uh, what's happening at this point, uh, the elders made an executive decision that we would have an executive team composed of myself, uh, Jack Tamplin, and Craig Cook. And we will be the executive team that goes back to the elders with anything that uh, we feel as though we need their input, expertise, and prayer on. I will be the individual who will be here at the church on a daily basis to work with Dale and the staff and make the decision. This is an interim position. Uh, this summer I, I teach at the college and also in the, in the southern school system and I had free time. So they asked me if I would be willing to do that, which I graciously accepted. Uh, so therefore, uh, Craig Cook and Jack and I uh, met this past Monday to set a plan up. If you remember, there was a vision cast uh, for the Wilmington Church of Christ uh, a few weeks back and uh, to grow spiritually, numerically, and financially. And we were concerned about how are we going to implement that? How are we going to move forward from what we were presented? So this team and the elders are uh, working together and this group of executives that I just mentioned to you will be part of that. Dale and I will be working uh, very closely together uh, to uh, move forward, which we have. We've had meetings with uh, Heather and Tony and Brockmeyer and myself to work out an annual calendar, which we'll be presenting to you uh, in the next few days or weeks, or months. 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 <laughs> sure, I'm one that...
want to do it the right way, and then God will bless us and all that. That's right. And, and in, along with those prayers, uh, the elders are still praying for Brian and Rachel. One of the one of the things I read in that book I mentioned, Beyond Forgiveness, was that pastor says one of the things we forgot to do is pray as a church for our brother who is hurting. So we won't stop praying for Brian. We, we're going to pray as a church more. Um, one of the questions also is Brian and Rachel are they going to come back and worship? And I know the elders are considering that question, and they're weighing um, things that. That we don't know things that we do know in their way in the protection of our church and the protection of Brian and his family um, in that decision. So where, where are we going to go next as I close out today and then try to run off stage? <laughs> Some people don't have to worry about getting a mohawk, Charlie. <laughs> I do this every now and then with David. Uh, one of the things I want to apologize for my false start. I felt like so I was in school running track and was in the, in the blocks ready to give up. And he says, no, not yet, Charlie. Well, that's up. But anyway, apologize for that. Uh, there's a note. Can I read this note real quickly? Sure. I got this from uh, one of our elders, Craig Cook. It says, as we talk this morning, which we talk about every morning, I think there is a large underutilized pool of very talented, capable, and motivated people in the church. Amen. They're wanting to be involved in the growth and success of Wilmington Church of Christ, but today have been pretty much just observers. We were asked, we have asked them to do tasks or projects that were appropriate, and we're asking to give you the guidance and training to move forward. The result, we hope to be able to assist and supplement what is going on with these individuals. We know they would love and feel very involved and fulfilled. This has been done sporadically in the past. It can be done much better in the future. Believe me, I was approached this morning about this very thing. We have very capable people who have not been asked, who are not being utilized. Believe me, we will do that and we can forward. We need your help and we, Lord knows we need your prayers and guidance. Perfectly said uh, about yeah. Uh, especially about the utilization of the church body. Uh, what if I, I kind of had this image in my mind? Remember that the head snap back wave that we had uh, last week that I, I saw explained today. It went from the front row on back and shot. Well, but I got a note from somebody in the church that says, uh, somebody in our church, our believers, that said, I'm going to be there for Brian. I don't, I don't care what he's done. He, he is still my friend. I'm still going to love on him. And I'm still going to be available to him. And we had a, another friend of our church come recently, and, and he, Danny, you stood up here and confessed. You said, I love you, church, for loving me. Thank you for showing me Christ. What, what if we kind of had that same ripple effect that we had as shock? as the grace we can extend to the community. What if God is going to use our church to have that same attitude? I'm going to love you. I'm going to be there for you. I don't care what you have done, but I'm going to show you what God says about it. And we just have this ripple effect all through Wilmington where God's grace just begins flowing down the streets and the side streets and the homes and people start turning their hearts toward Christ. That's how we're going to be utilized as a church. That's how we're going to do it. We're going to tell people the gospel. We're going to share the good news. And we're going to share that love and grace with you. Why don't you stay up here while I, I close this out? Um, would you stand with me, please? I'll pray for us, and then we're dismissed. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for Jesus Christ, that he restores our souls, that he makes us right with him. We pray for our, for our dear friend and brother in Christ, Brian. We pray for him and his family. And, and please, God, don't be silent or still in his life. Just move completely. And we're praying, Lord, for a complete restoration, Brian. God, don't be silent or still among our elders. Continue to guide them with wisdom through your written word. And God, don't be silent or still among us. Motivate us to find somebody to give the good news to. Lord, you will not be mocked. We will reap what we sow. You promise us that. 
But at the same time, you don't let any sin go unpunished. And at the same time, you offer forgiveness and grace and mercy and love. All to the point of restoring us into your family. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the leaders of this church. Thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.